Hey, David. Hello. Oh. Good morning. Uh, okay. Good morning. Let me turn on the cam. Hey, there you Hi go. There. Yeah. Can you see me now? Yes. Can you see me? Yeah. I can hear you great too. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you doing today? Ah, I'm a little tired. It's nighttime here, but morning for you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because uh, when you asked me for uh, like 5 p.m. Eastern, I was thinking, I was like, wait, that's 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> right. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I, I, get, I should know better. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, we need we need to we need to find a, uh, a great time to uh, to match our schedule because we have like twelve hours apart between us. Yeah. Oh, this is fine. Um, it's been a uh, crazy day in the U.S. markets, though. So. Oh yeah, it is. A bit. I woke up this morning. I saw it because when I uh, when I slept last night, it was um, it was still uh, like I think it's like minus ten or something like the the Dow. Uh, no, sorry, the S and P. And when I woke up this morning, it's already pretty bad. Yeah, it was bouncing around. Yeah. So what, what did you trade? Uh, I trade uh, volatility products, so products on the VIX mostly. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was a uh, equity options market maker in Chicago so for many years, so I, I was a floor trader. Mm -hmm. and, oh, okay. Uh, and since then, uh, I, t I was away from the markets for a while, and then I came back. And since then, I've been trading as a retail options customer. Ah, okay. I see. But, wow. um, but I, uh, I don't know very much about Forex. Um, but I have lived in several different places. I lived in Italy for uh, about seven years. And I lived in England for four years. And uh, France, so... Uh, I have my father is an international businessman, so I have some understanding of sort of world uh, affairs and whatnot. <laughs> okay, I see. Uh, my my father's actually been to Jakarta a few times, uh, and also oh, to, really? yeah, and also to Philippines and uh, Bali, um, South Korea, Japan. Well, uh, it's well traveled then. Yeah, he was you, should, you should come by. You should come by to Jakarta sometimes. You know. Yeah. I'll yeah. show you around. I, I I heard it's very nice. Um, it's very nice, except for the traffic jams. Oh right. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad the traffic over here. Because um, I used to be, I used to go to school at, at, in the U.S. Right, I, I went to, uh, in L.A. The traffic was pretty bad over there, right? But here is even worse than that. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it. Like, uh, yeah, if you have LA is bad over here, it's, it's worse than that. So is um, is it all just surrounding Jakarta that the traffic's bad, or is it? Uh... Um, yeah, it's pretty much all of them in Jakarta. So especially during rush hour, I mean, you can get in, uh, you can get stuck in traffic for like a few hours. Wow. So um, yeah, so let's just uh, let's just turn it on. I'm just I, I turned the record on already, but we can just start talking. Okay. I, I'm very uh, relaxed, uh, and I, I like just casual interview style is great. Um, more exciting pe for people maybe than uh, all technical all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, so you live outside the city, is that it? Yes, I live about like um, like forty minutes from uh, from the from downtown. In the suburbs, because um, because I trade at home, right? So I don't really have to go anywhere else. So that's why I enjoy uh, living around here instead of in downtown and in the city. Because, like I said, the traffic in Jakarta is really bad. So if you live out uh, in there, I mean, it's gonna take you a few hours just to get you know, like some places. Oh wow! Is there pollution also? Oh, pretty bad, yeah. yeah. Because um, all because with the traffic jams and everything, and then you have like um, the factories around it. So yeah, the, the pollution is pretty bad. So um, um, so uh, Indonesia is a uh, mainly Muslim country. Is that, is that right? Is that's right. Uh, yeah. About ninety percent of the population are Muslims. I have some friends uh, from a, actually a Facebook game who uh, were from uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, oh, huh? it was very uh, my first sort of introduction to Muslim culture. I had a friend also from uh, 
uh, Egypt. And uh, they would, you know, they would pray uh, uh, at the different times every day. And mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, Saudi Arabia is such a uh, it, it, there's many uh, sort of ironies about Saudi Arabian culture. It's 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 very interesting when it was explained to me. But um, is is Jakarta a very a very uh, secular place or is it a very religious place? Would you say? Uh, no, really. Uh, actually, in Indonesia, we kind of like diversify. Even though it's a mostly um, uh, po uh, Muslim populated uh, country. But um, over here, we have a lot of diversity. I mean, we have um, all kinds of religions. We have um, Buddhism, uh, Catholic, and Christians. Uh, we, have, we have some Hindus in uh, Bali. So, um, yeah, uh, we pretty much diversify, especially with a lot of um, like uh, foreigners too living in Jakarta and everything. So it's not really uh, like um, like other Muslim country, like, you, like the one you mentioned, like um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and everything. So it's pretty, it's not, it's pretty much not a secure country over here. So that's interesting. It's hard. It's hard for me to imagine because most of my experience only comes from what my father has told me, and uh, <laughs> the the United States, the uh, the uh, culture and the press is is so um, focused just on the United States that it's uh, it's hard to learn things from here from uh, just the television and things like that. I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. Because um, when I uh, when I was still in high school, right, I I was imagining um how how U, uh, U.S. would be, right? Because I've never been to U.S. before, and when I, I experienced myself in college, and then that's how you truly uh, learn, and then um, kind of like see if it's if what people are saying is true or not, you know. Well, I think so. The only yeah, the only way you could do it is I mean, you could you could feel it just experience it by yourself. Yeah, I mean, I found from, you know, I lived overseas. Well, at one point it was w well over half of my life. And uh, my experience was similar to a lot of people in that what I realized is that it, it's, it would seem obvious, but it's not obvious to a lot of people. But what I realized is that everybody's pretty much the same, you know, <laughs> and, uh, That's what, mm? and uh, every culture you go to, there's some cool people there's some people that are jerks there's some people that are open-minded there's some people that are, are closed-minded and uh but everybody's is somewhat the same and uh that unfortunately a lot of countries they don't really broadcast that message they try to say well our country is the best and everybody else is different and <laughs> uh you know i lived in france for a while and they had a culture of very much uh very proud of of their country oh definitely yeah yeah. yeah, because even some uh, over there, I mean, if you ask them in questions in English, they'll, they'll still answer you in French or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. And some of those guys had studied English for like 12 years, too, and they, they didn't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny. So, um, so d did you grow up in uh, Indonesia? Yeah, uh, I was born and raised in Indonesia um, up to high school, and then I went to college in the U.S., and I worked there for a couple of years, and then I came back to Indonesia in uh, 2008. And you were in Los Angeles? Yes, I was in Los Angeles. Uh, I went to uh, Carpoli Pomona. That's like, uh, it's like, uh, the Los Angeles is like the America of movies. <laughs> That's right. Like, uh, the, they export American culture from there. <laughs> um, my roommate, I went to university in Boston, and uh, I was an international student because I was coming from Europe, and I, I was surrounded by some people who had come from uh, South America to the United States for the first time. Mm -hmm. This guy had also gone to Los Angeles to guitar camp. And uh, oh, okay. he, he had similar uh, uh, experience that you did, of, uh, I think, uh, of it. So um, was it hard for you to come back from the United States? Did you want to stay here? Uh, no, really. Actually, I wanted to come back, you know, because I, I was kind of missing my family, you know. I can imagine. Cause, um, yeah, I was I was there with uh, with only my sister. Uh, she went to school over there too. So um, after a while, I kind of missed my dad and my, my mom. You know, we only talk on the phone like uh, every like once twice a week. So after that, I decided to come back, and it was um, it was a pretty good experience over there. I mean, I learned a lot of things over there. But you know, at, at the end, I think somehow I I feel I feel like I still belong. I like I really like living in Indonesia. Well, there's no place like home, right? 
That's right. So is your sister a similar age to you? Uh, no, my sister is uh, five years younger than me. I have a sister. She's three years younger than me. And we were both uh, actually in university in the United States when my parents were over in Europe. So uh, maybe a little bit of a similar situation. Like she and I, we were the only, uh, you know, on the holidays, we would hang out sometimes together because uh, our rest of our family was far away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> You can't always go home all the way home just for one holiday, like I don't know, like Easter or whatever. Uh, you know, so it was uh, it was nice to have her there. Yeah, it was nice at least having someone, you know, someone over there instead of being by yourself. So, if I can just ask a really stupid question, so which uh, which languages do they speak in in Indonesia? Uh, Indonesian, Indonesian, Indonesian language. It's um, pretty similar to. Um, uh, Malay Malaysian language, uh, but uh, we have some like uh, the structures and everything are the same. But, like some of the words are a little bit different. Is it similar to uh, Philippines, like ta Tagalog? Uh, uh, no, it's totally different from Philippines, from the Tagalog. Hmm? So how did you did you learn? How did you initially learn English? Uh, we learned it in school already, uh, from primary until like uh, until high school. So, but um, we didn't speak it uh, fluently because we only learned like the grammar stuff like that, but we didn't really have like a conversation, a lot of conversation in English. So, the, uh, I learned a lot of English, especially like the slang terms and everything and the idioms uh, when I went to, uh, went to college in the U.S. Well, yeah, your English is excellent, so. I, I, oh, found that, I found that with with uh, with French and Italian is that there is no way I could have learned without going to the country and hanging out there for a while and having people uh, correct me and this sort of thing because you learn it in a book but you're not quite sure if the actually real people say those things or or how it, it really works until you're actually around the lo people that this is their first language you know yeah that's right hmm? so how many I think that's the, only, the best way to learn lang a language yeah. Uh, so, how many people speak Indonesian in, in the world? Um, actually, a lot of them. Uh, we have a lot of Indonesians in, uh, like overseas. Um, I think I've been to uh, like a few countries, and like the countries that I visited, I've met some Indonesians over there. So there are quite a lot of people. I mean, not a lot of foreigners speak Indonesians, but a lot of Indonesians are overseas, and then sometimes they marry to to the uh, to the native of the country and everything. So. Uh, well, so at least like the spouses or the kids are speaking Indonesian too. Well, I, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but when I think of Indonesia, I think of tsunami. Uh, oh, the one in 2004, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a really big uh, something. Some it was a really big thing, you know, over here after that. Especially after uh, Bill Clinton came came to visit and everything, you know. And also, but it was it was a really bad bad something bad enough for that yeah i watched a bunch of movies and stuff on it and also the the airplanes disappearing uh, oh yeah yeah that was a big big one too. yes that one so um so how did you meet dale uh actually we met online through twitter so um i like to tweet my stuff about forex you know and then um he was hosting a, a trading room so um, I was I was I was looking at it and I joined the trading room and then we kind of like uh, met over there and then we talked a lot about the market and that's how we connected. He's a, he's a pretty interesting guy, isn't he? He's uh... oh he is. I mean he has a lot of things to teach you, you know not even like not not only about the market but about life itself. So it's really nice talking to him. Yeah, he seems like a really nice guy. Um... Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I started on this uh, journey of interviewing people and uh, I've really gotten a lot out of it because, uh, first of all, I've gotten to meet some people that I would not have had access to if I didn't have uh, followers. But also, mm -hmm. um, I've just expanded my circle of, of acquaintances uh, a, a lot in the last, I, I've only been doing this sort of thing for about uh, three or four months, but uh it's uh it's it's been really it's been really expanding expanding my uh my life so it's it's very it's very cool um and i i did an interview with dale uh, uh a few weeks ago uh a friend of mine uh, introduced me to dale and then um he said to me well uh, i'm going to uh introduce you to some other people over time 
and uh and you're the first one he introduced me to so <laughs> yeah it's, it's cool. i saw i saw this interview with you too and i was uh, i enjoyed it pretty much you know it was it was like uh, i saw the interview and i was like wow i mean it's not it's you it's like you guys are just talking as a friend you know it's instead of like an interview itself well, it's interesting because we kind of uh, had a, had a similar background of how we started in the in the market by, uh, which is sort of like a traditional way, or it used to be, where you you go down and get like minimum wage job on the exchange, just uh, uh, being like basically a slave to all the traders, <laughs> and and you you beg them to to teach you something, and and you come up that way. It doesn't really exist anymore now with uh, the internet and uh, electronics, but uh, we were able to sort of connect because of the, of that. Mm, yeah, I see. Yeah. So yeah, I because watched, everything is done online now, you know. Yeah, and in 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 some ways it, it's it's amazing and it's a great great thing. Uh, but it is definitely different than the way business was done before. Uh, my, my job uh, as a trader pretty much disappeared in uh, 2000, about four, because they just didn't need people to, to make the market anymore once the computers came around very much. I mean, at least one person could do the job of 10, you know? That's right. So, um, and my, uh, my roommate in Chicago was uh, a clerk in the yen pit. So that was my first experience with Forex or not Forex, but yeah, uh, with, uh, you know, trading foreign currencies. He was, uh, he was trading by himself, but he was also a clerk and I started to, f to follow it a little bit, but, um, um, I never got, got very much involved. I was, uh, when, when we lived in Europe, we were always concerned with, you know, the exchange because my father was getting paid partially in British pounds, partially in Italian lira. At the time, there wasn't the euros yet uh, taking over all of Europe. And so we kept track of it just for economic reasons for the family, but I, I was never really... When I talked to Dale, it was really the first time I, I really even asked about different pairs and things like that. So you have to be patient with me because I... I there's so many parts of finance and this is not one I know about, so... Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, we. I mean, a lot of market we have. You know, we have stocks market and everything. So everybody has their their own specialty. I mean, yeah, there's so many little spots, um, and you just have to find one little spot that makes money, and and that's it. <laughs> that's right. Mm? So, um, how, how did did you get interested in the markets when you were when you were very young? I don't know. Actually, I don't know anything about stock market and everything because uh, my my dad um, didn't really invest in stock markets or everything, you know. So whatever he has, he just put it back in his business and everything. So I didn't really learn um, stock market until I got my first job uh, in the U.S. Because um, when I got my first job, some of my like um, my uh, senior uh, associates, you know, everything. They were investing um, their money in 401k and stock markets and everything, and, and that's the first time I got introduced to the stock market. Uh, no, before, but before that, I didn't know anything about markets at all, you know. So, what, what sort of business did, was your dad involved in? Uh, my dad has some. some uh, he has a um, uh, silica sand mining, you know, for the glass industry and everything. Oh, that's and he cool. also has some. Uh, yeah, he has uh, uh, trucking companies, and then so. Uh, but I really didn't get into his business too at the beginning because um, he didn't really want us to uh, to get into the same business with him. You know, he just wanted us to do whatever we like. So he didn't really force us to get into his business so, in the beginning. What, what did he think of uh, of the markets? I mean, my father, for example, was very skeptical of me becoming in the stock markets. He, 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 he didn't think it was a real job and I kind of had to convince him and uh try to show him that it actually was a real job you know he want i think he wanted to me to be like a doctor or a lawyer or something like that <laughs> well i mean if you if you grow up in, in if you grow up in like an asian family they expect you to be like a lawyer or a doctor or something you know at least an engineer or something like that so that's what i did I, actually i went to uh, i took um i graduated with a chemical engineering degree uh when i went to college so yeah so uh, and then I got a job at an engineering company over there. And then when I came back to Indonesia, right, because uh, I was interested in stock market and everything, so I started investing in the, in the stock market and everything. 
even my dad was kind of skeptical in the beginning but when he sees uh, like how the mark uh, when i uh, explain it to him and everything he kind of um, kind of get it and you know and he told me like you know what as long as it makes you happy about it uh, you can just do it you know oh nice yeah that's really nice yeah i made the mistake of getting into business with my father and uh the, it didn't work out i was undercapitalized i had my dad help to back me to to trade on my own and it didn't work out and it, it, i mean our, our relationship is okay now still but it, it's very difficult to go into business with family members especially when you you don't totally understand the business <laughs> so definitely yeah so i would i would advise against doing that possibly <laughs> anyway um so uh so you, you worked for an engineering uh firm to begin with um what sort of engineering did you study in school? Uh, chemical engineering. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was working for this um, engineering company who is a consultant for some of the refineries in the U.S. So uh, uh, we started uh, designing some of their part of the plants and everything, their process. So I was kind of enjoying that uh, part because I really like um, chemistry and math when I was in college. You know, there's a lot of... There are a lot of traders that come out of engineering. It's, I think it's a very common thing. Um, I was watching this guy. Uh, he has Chat with Traders podcast. Are you familiar with that? It's like Aaron Fifield. He's a guy from Australia. And he oh, was, yeah. I thought, uh, yeah, he was interviewing a, uh, a, uh, a quant trader who uh, came out of engineering just recently as well. I think it's, it's very common because it, engineering gives you a sort of organized way of thinking that that is very uh, good for for traders i think so um but so when you switch from en uh, engineering to trading y it must have been like sort of a pay cut and and a less less uh less of a, a steady salary it, how, how did it work out at first for you uh no actually at first i didn't i um i didn't just uh switch to trading full time you know uh when i was trading uh in the beginning i still have uh I was still helping my my dad's company in the beginning, so uh, the reason I came back to Indonesia in two thousand eight was kind of uh, because the, well I miss my family and then the other thing is um uh, my dad wanted me to help him with his company too in the beginning so I was helping him uh, with the company and then I was trading too part time and then after a while after I start making a steady profit and then uh, steady profit and it was it was kind of like uh, enough for me. Uh, for my living styles and everything so i i switched to full time and then after that so it was a really bad transition you know like instead of going to full time and then, and then get, uh, finding out that you don't have a steady income and everything like that how, how long ago was that uh i started in 2008 after the financial crisis crisis so the, uh, the the reason i uh, i was uh, interested in uh, in 2008 was after the market crash uh, you can buy like some of the really good stocks at a really cheap price, you know. So I I uh, I start buying some of them, um, trading some of them, and then investing some of them, and then I was making a uh, pretty good money, you know, because uh, after that financial crisis, you know, everything uh, when everything is normalized and everything, uh, it goes up really, really. I mean, you almost like triple of uh, quadruple your investment and everything. So it was it was a good time, you know, to start. Uh, transitioning so I really had a good timing on that too oh nice yeah I was completely out of the market from like 2005 until probably 2015 and like I went so far away from it like I, I just was like I'm not a trader anymore I, and I didn't pay any attention to that period so when you talk about that period I don't even I know that there was something happened in 2008 but I'm not keyed into the, the I I would assume there was a big rally right after that but uh but but uh, it's like I, I need to go back and study that period as far as my charts because I haven't uh, I haven't studied that much. So you were basically uh, get, trying to uh, buy stocks that that were very depressed at the time. That's right. And then uh, so that's been that was about ten years ago. So it's been a, it's been. Uh, yeah. So, well, ten. Uh, well, I started in late two thousand eight, so like nine nine years ago. So. So how did you switch to to to, to forex? Uh, for me, forex has always been the hardest thing because <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I I I have always been sort of afraid of it. I don't understand it at all, and I would never switch to it. So how how did how did that come about for you? Actually, in uh, let me see, in two thousand 
2009, late 2009 or late 2010, a friend of mine introduced uh, uh, Forex to me. So uh, he was trading stocks too, right? So uh, I was I was uh, talking things about uh, so, like with the stocks with him, and then he uh, he showed me a uh, forex charts, you know. So like, I, so I asked him like, uh, what kind of market is that? And then he said like, oh, this is forex market. I mean, uh, so he started explaining things to me, you know, how the forex market is always open twenty four seven, and then like you have uh, more pairs to trade instead of uh, stocks, you know. So I was kind of interested, you know, because that's the thing. It's open 24-7. I mean, you can trade anytime you want because the stock market, because uh, I only trade uh, stocks, uh, local stocks, right, in Indonesia. So they're only open from 9 to 4 every day. And then after that, I have nothing to do with it. Uh, so just wait. You have to wait for the next morning to trade and everything. So when you told me, like, the market, the first market is open 24-7, right, I start uh, getting interested. So uh, I asked him to, to teach me more about it and explain it. I mean, um, I do my trades mostly on um, technical analysis. So, uh, I mean, charts is charts, right? No matter what the market is. So when I look at it, I mean, I could still do some analysis on the forex market. So the only thing I need to learn is how, like, how to use the leverage and everything. So, but it was it was interesting, you know. And once I started trading forex, you know, um, I find that the market is more interesting and more life and then more volatile than than the for than the stock market. So I switch, uh, I pretty much switched to forex markets since uh, two thousand eleven. Oh wow, that's interesting. So let me just ask you, like, let's say you were talking to my mother who like really doesn't know much about the stock market or trading or anything like that. How would you explain, like, like? How would you how would you start to explain about forex to her? Like, what would be the first pair that that somebody would should should look at in the forex? Could you just go through a couple different uh, uh, pairs and explain uh, some just basic relationships between them? Uh, I know Dale was trying to help me with that too, and he was talking about the dollar a little bit. But um, could you just kind of explain like to like if if you were talking to like maybe a young person in in high school or something? Uh, very simply, uh, just some basics about forex. Uh, well, I will explain it. Like it's, I mean, forex market is just kind of like a market, you know. So if you look, if you go like, uh, say if you go like, uh, if you're, uh, say you're, if you're a merchant, right? Uh, you want to buy something low and you want to sell it high, right? Of course. So that's how you find, uh, pretty much like every other market, you want to find like a, a supplier that can you give you lower prices. So, and after that, you can sell um, at a higher prices to, to your customers. So uh, the same thing with the forex market. I mean, the only thing, the, the only difference between those two, uh, I mean, in real market, you're selling real things, right? Say you're selling a, a computer or you're selling a cell phone, something like that. But in forex market, you're selling the currency. Uh, so say if you're trading, uh, well, the most traded currency uh, um, is uh, Euro USD, right? Uh, Euro, uh, Euro against the USD. So it's pretty much um, uh, you're looking at if you want to buy the, you want to keep uh, your assets in Euro or in USD. So say if if you think, uh, if you look at the charts or if you do fun fundamental analysis, you know, uh, whatever you want, uh, whatever analysis that you do, say you find out that um, Euro is much stronger than USD. So the, the, the thing that you want is you want to buy the Euro and then sell all US, sell all your uh, USD assets and then change it to Euro because it's going to give you more, uh, pretty much more returns because everybody's going to buy Euro so you can buy it now and then you can sell the Euro later to somebody who wants to buy it at a higher price. Now, so that's uh, pretty much it. So um, Now are companies, do companies uh, like big multinational companies have to uh, participate in the Forex markets to conduct their business? Oh, definitely. I mean, if they're doing business in like uh, like so many countries, uh, they they usually hedge their uh, their currency uh, rate exchange for that. So uh, a lot of companies are going to keep tabs on on like what's the currency exchange rate on that one. Because um, say if they use a uh, euro to pay for the company, like say uh, like an Indonesian company over here, they're doing business with a company in Europe, right? Uh, of course, the, the like the company in Europe, they're gonna ask for payment in euro instead of like Indonesian rupiah, right? So uh, the company over here, they need to uh, they need to know like say the payment is due in like an um, a month or so, they need to know what the exchange rate is gonna be in like a month or so, 
or if they know the exchange right now, right, they can like hatch it and buy it now, so they know like their fixed cost is gonna be. So like as soon as they figure out what sort of payment they need to make to somebody somewhere else, they might actually do a forex transaction right then to lock in the price versus their local currency or, or something like that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Or if they if if they want, they can do uh, like you say. Uh, you say they they know. I mean uh, they. The estimate is gonna be like the euro is gonna drop against the the, the, the currency over here. Uh, they're gonna hatch it and then like say buy it later on, you know. But the risk is if it goes up, then their production cost is gonna increase. So what? Um, and I, I suppose some of them also just sort of trade it. Like they they have experts in the company that say, well, we 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 really believe that the euro is gonna go lower over the next six months, so maybe we'll hold off for now. That sort of that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, I think they they usually have like uh like because they usually have a relationship with the bank or something uh with some of the banks. So the banks usually will tell them you know like oh you can do it now or you can hedge it uh, buy it later or something like that. What about uh governments? Do do uh, different countries uh do the government themselves uh use the the forex markets? Uh, uh, yeah, I think this. Uh, so pretty much the like some uh, the participants in the forex markets are the, like the central banks of the of the countries, uh, the companies uh, of the country, and like some of the retail traders like me. So uh, yeah, but uh, the central banks are pretty much active in like um, in uh, the exchange rate to to you know to manage the exchanges of the country. I was um I traded briefly. I traded uh the u.s bonds i traded 30-year bond options and uh so we always had to keep track of what the federal u.s federal reserve was saying and also uh, bond auctions w what are some of the uh the most important financial reports for a forex trader to to follow oh well we have a lot of um data that that's really affects your the currency rate i mean you have the like say the employment the unemployment you know and then the trade balance the and definitely the interest rate of the country so like when the fed the feds uh because the talk of this year is the fed is going to hike uh like three times right so that's going to uh definitely affect the 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 currency rate and everything so but a lot of data actually uh like the gdp gdp also so uh we can't pinpoint just one data that's going to change uh, i mean to affect the a lot of uh, data is going to affect it uh but uh if you uh because a lot of websites offer uh, like the economic calendar for for forex right so you can just take a look at it and then see what data is coming out today from uh for which currency are there certain categories of forex traders like for example uh i would imagine there would be people that just rely strictly on technical analysis but then i would imagine there are some people that would be sort of fundamental traders who would like take very close uh, attention to world events and, and try to like make a macro view of what's happening in the world and then translate that into a, a currency trade. Um, are most of the people around you uh, technical traders or are they are they sort of macro traders or are there different categories that I don't know about also? Uh, well, the the one that I usually talk to I and mean, a lot discuss about uh, for the market and everything, most of them are technical analysis. Uh, technical analysis uh, traders so they usually just rely on charts to make the decisions but i i know a few guys who who base on on the fundamentals uh combined with the technical analysis so they need some reasons to for the move in the in the charts and everything yeah because my my roommate when i was in chicago he he you know he was a clerk in the yen pit and he was trying to figure it out and he was trying to use just world news and macro news to trade the yen and it was very very mm -hmm. difficult it was very difficult for him because uh there were, seemed to be so much more that was going into it um and li li like i said i n i don't know um uh, you know I, I know basic technical analysis i i was uh, trained as an options trader so what we were using is volatility ranges for stocks like for example we would look at the range of volatility of options in a stock over a certain period of time and then make a bet on volatility moves without making a directional bet. So it was a very different thing than uh, mm -hmm. making directional bets based on technical analysis. But um, Dale um, was talking a little bit about uh, 
Elliot, Elliot Wave um, analysis, and maybe um, we could just go through some some of the basics of that. It, it, would that be okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, we can go, we can do that. Do you have Do you have uh, a way of looking? Do you have a way of putting charts up there, or? or? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me share my screen first. All right. Okay. And uh, yeah, you know, I we can always edit it if it doesn't work perfectly. Okay, can you can you can you see the screen now? Um, no, I don't see it. It just okay. It just went blank. It's just like um, okay. Me here. Oh, it's showing up on me already. So. On mine is showing up. Let me see. Oh wait, now something's starting to show up when you did that. Maybe uh, is hmm. when I see your screen, I see like an infinity uh, background. Now I see something. Okay, that's working. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, good. Okay, so in Elliott wave, we have uh, two kinds of waves. Actually, we have the impulsive wave and the correction wave. So the impulsive wave is usually the the way uh, like uh, the direction of the trend, right? So say we have like an an uptrend in uptrend, uh, we call that uh, uptrend uh, the impulsive wave. So whatever comes down after that is only a retracement part of it. Okay. And then uh, in Elliott wave for the impulsive wave, usually we have a five wave uh, either up or down, right? So it depends on the trend. So uh, say for this case we have an uptrend. So uh, the the wave the wave is going to be five wave up, and then in in Elliott wave uh, we have a fractal. It's a fractal too, which means that in the wave one itself, if you break it down to a smaller time frame, it's going to show like a five wave move too. Uh, okay, and then. And then for the correction wave, uh, the simple part uh, usually it comes in um, uh, uh, three wave down or uh, three wave up if it's in uh, downtrend. So usually it's just A, B, and C like that. Okay. And then after that's going to be another five wave move up, and then five, uh, three wave move down, and keep going like that until the train the trend changes later on. So where do they? Uh, where does the name Elliott wave come from? Uh, it's from the founder. I forgot what's his first name, but it's something Elliot. So that's why they call it Elliot Wave. And what's the significance of the, the number five? Uh, is it is it part of just the Fibonacci and the uh, the the natural natural uh, numbers that, that work together? Yeah, because um, actually it's just because um, um, he kind of noticed how the market moves on like the psychology. Uh, it's a uh, five. So he's he he's he did like case studies, and then uh, he found that uh, usually it's like uh, the move for the market, like in a trend, it it usually has like five waves up. So the first first wave is like uh you know like the beginning of the trend. So when people hasn't joined in anything, and then the third wave is like the the really impulsive wave. That's when like most of the traders are going in and then the five waves are the fifth wave are the the like the last move of the of the of the trend like say uh like for the people who, you know like some of the retailers like how they usually get in late in the market yeah. when they see like a clear uptrend and that's where they usually get in so yeah it's one of those so, things where yeah. like once they the people finally feel that it's confirmed and they get in and that's when the pros are getting out <laughs> That's right. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, and then and then we saw uh, we're gonna see this like three wave down. You know, like it's the same one. Like the A is like the beginning of the going down. You know, like that's when that's what you said. You know, like uh, when the pros are getting out. You know, and then B is B is like the like, false hope wave. You know, like when it's going up, and then the retail is like, oh yeah, it's going back up. Hmm. And then the C is the the final down where people like the retailers are getting out. And then before we start going to for like a five wave up again. Now, do do you do you see this pattern repeating itself a, a lot? Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the of the real, uh, like this charts. Let me open my charts first. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. 
So yeah. So uh, this is the charts of a uh, Euro USD in a weekly time frame. Okay. So yeah. So if you see, it, uh, we have a one over here. Can you see this one? Okay. Okay. Yep. We have one uh, wave one, wave two, and then we have uh, wave three going up, and then four, and then right now, uh, if my count is correct, uh, we are in the mid, uh, uh, almost at the end of wave five. It's hard to tell if there might be those little head fakes in there, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look, the the thing is with uh, Elliott wave, you look at uh, like a smaller time frame, it's kind of difficult for you to really see the trend. That's why I like to move to the, like a monthly or weekly uh, time frame to really see the the big wave. Because like I said, it's it's factor, right? So you can actually um, break it down later on in smaller time frame. Hmm. But I like to uh, view it in a, like a really big time frame first, so I could see what the where the uh, where the big trend is going up. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is, uh, I'm sorry, so you said this is a uh, monthly candlestick? Yeah, uh, no, sorry, this is a weekly, a weekly uh, okay. chart. Okay, cool. So based on this, you, you would be looking to, to, to get short pretty soon? Uh, yeah, because uh, right now if you break it down uh, to a small time frame, let me, let me move it to a small time frame. Uh, we're in, the, in wave five right now. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, if you break it down, you only see uh, one, two, three, and then four. Uh, I, I think we still have another final push for the five up here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm definitely getting short later on, but not now, though. Okay. But I think we're at the end of the move. Now, um, uh, do you think that the dollar will be... Uh dominant forever in the world or is it it's sort of changing I, I i heard that like china is starting to uh, uh list some oil in in uh uh in their own currency now or something like that um do, do, mm -hmm. do you see evidence of the dollar like becoming less important in the world well actually uh i have a dollar chart over here so if you look at it um let me see let me move it to weekly one um I think you can still see, uh, uh, okay. So here we have a, a correction uh, wave. So if we see this is one, two, three, and four over here, and then I think we might see more weakness for the dollar uh, in the coming weeks. Hmm. Uh, I don't think dollar uh, weakness is done yet for now. So I think we might see more downward move, in, especially if you go to the, uh, to the daily chart. And then you look at uh, the this candle uh, right here, uh, yesterday's candle. It was a pretty bad uh, rejection mm. uh, from the resistance over there. So uh, I think we still we're going to see like in the coming weeks uh, more dollar weakness coming. But at, uh, in the long term, I mean, for this year, I, I see. Uh, I think dollar actually uh, is going to be more stronger for this year. It seems like both charts you showed me, we were uh, in part four of the wave somewhere yes that's right so uh because uh, like i said uh, the most traded uh currency is euro usd right so the uh, dxy the us dollar currency index uh i think 60 something percent of the of the weight is weighted to euro so it's kind of like um like the inverse of the euro usd chart so um that makes like sense. i said uh, euro usd yeah euro usd has more uh more, a little bit more uh strength coming in the in the coming weeks so that's that means a little more downward uh, more for the us dollar that's interesting um so after the euro us dollar what's the next biggest pair that that people uh that, that's the strongest or uh, that's the biggest effect in the dollar would you say uh, the second, I think the second most traded uh, currency is the uh, USD Jap uh, Japanese yen. Okay. So the USD Japanese yen. Um, let me see if I chart for that. Okay. Yeah. So even in the USD Japanese yen, because um, I I did put a two over here, but the thing is, I don't think it's done. I think it has um, more weakness coming coming to for the USD yen before uh, we can finally go up for the wave three later on. So 
uh, yeah, it's still showing the same the same uh, effect as uh, Euro USD. So uh, I think USD USD uh, weakness is is coming soon sooner sooner than later. So do you um how how do you trade? Do you do you do you make trades every day? Do you make a hundred trades every day? Do you make one trade a month? What sort of uh, frequency do you do you trade? Uh, no, actually, because I I trade uh, I'm I'm more like a swing trader, so um, I usually just find a setup that's uh, really good. So because uh, the thing is with the corrective wave in um, elite wave is kind of tricky, so I mostly trade it on the impulse uh, impulsive wave. So when I find a really good setup, uh, I would trade. So I only I only place place like uh, say five to ten trades a month. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. So I don't really trade every day. I mean, I look at the chart every day, but uh, if I don't find any setup that satisfy my requirement, then I would just stay stay on the side. Yeah, I, I I'm actually similar to that. I I have sort of longer term positions that I put on and just leave for a while. Yeah, and that that definitely help you, you know, just get the stress out of way, you know. But like when you have position every day, I mean, you're gonna be like uh, stress out and, uh, and grind out by the end of the day. Yeah, I like to do what you do as well, which is to back up the charts a little bit to get um, the big picture. Um, especially when stuff starts moving a lot, I like to back out farther in the charts so that I can keep perspective for myself. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at the big and then looking at the big time frame, it kind of remove like all the noise from the charts. I mean, if you look at the smaller time frame charts, you know, it's going to the price action is going to be everywhere. I mean, it's kind of hard for you to get a read on the market. What is um? I don't mean to go too far off topic here, but um, do you uh? Do you do you think that the U.S. political, uh, like the day-to-day -day U.S. political uh, back and forth, has a big effect on the forex markets, or is it just uh, separate? Uh, no, I think actually the polit uh, the politics in in the U.S. is uh, definitely have uh, having some effect on the forex market. I mean, uh, every time you see like uh, say Donald Trump uh, tweeted something out. Uh, the the market will move, you know, and then um, and then all the uh, last time was the tax bill and everything. It, it kind of um, held the market for a while because they don't know what to expect. So it's definitely having an effect on the market. That's really amazing that like one guy sitting in front of his computer on Twitter can uh, move the the currencies of the world. I know he's a <laughs> he's a president, but it's still it's still uh, I can just imagine him the guy sitting there and like eating a cheeseburger or something and like tweeting something and all of a sudden the markets start going crazy. It's a, <laughs> it's a interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, you know, but that's, yeah. that's the fact. I mean, every time you put out something out, you know, like people will react to it. Yeah. Uh, cause, um, cause I don't think they've, they've ever seen like a president like this before, you know? Yeah. Well, for me, it's been uh, interesting for starting a YouTube channel in this period because uh, the United States politically has become very, very polarized in the last couple of years. And so uh, if you engage people in a conversation about politics, uh, you risk uh, get either getting in a fight or uh, you could become best friends or worst enemies just based on what you think about politics these days in the U.S. And so... It's something that I really try to avoid with my uh, interviews and things like that because uh, because of that. I, I can't afford to lose half of my uh, my guests. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. You know, even even when I tweet something, you know, I, I avoid something political. That's why I only post like charts in my uh, Twitter stream because yeah. you know, like uh, it's it's kind of sensitive stuff. You know, the politics. So uh, might as well just stay away from it. Yeah, we. Well, it was kind of similar when I had friends in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Like, uh, I would not want to get involved with the sensitive subjects concerning the United States and Saudi Arabia or United States and the Muslim world because I wanted to find ways to find, uh, you know, common ground with people, not things that could separate us. So, uh, mm -hmm. that's right. So I tried to to keep away from it, but I I can imagine that that. Uh, 
it looks pretty funny from other parts of the world, the U.S. Po political system. And, uh, you know, here, I, I believe other countries are a little bit like this, too, but the United States is so disinterested with the, the other countries of the world. And it, it's really sad for me being someone who lived outside the United States for a long time to, to feel that situation. Well, I mean, uh, not not just in the U.S. I mean, or even over here, you know, like because, um, like you said, we are like ninety percent Muslim country, so uh, pretty much religion play play some parts in the in in the politics as well, you know, and it's kind of like a sensitive subjects. Mm. So yeah, it's pretty much uh, things you want to avoid talking about with somebody, yeah. you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I I, I think that. Um, I come from uh, religious. I come from Protestant, uh, uh, Protestant religion, which comes from uh, Church of England. I I'm Episcopalian, and I think that uh, our parents are are known for having a, trying to instill a similar work ethic a as Asian parents in us. <laughs> they 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 they, <laughs> they 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 expecting a lot from us, and they're wanting us to to hit the books, and they. If they, you know, university has become so expensive over here that if they're paying for us to go to college, they 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 expect us to to uh, dig, you know, to to hit the books and uh, make something of ourselves. Definitely, that, at least that was the message that was given to me from my father. <laughs> well, I think your 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 father will make a uh, like a great Asian dad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um. All right, so um, so how how has the year been going for you as far as uh, trading trading? Um, actually, because um, uh, the thing is, I just started a trade copier service in, in November, right? So so uh, I've, when I started uh, the the service, um, well, I don't know if it's the market or me or, or me with the pressure and everything. So um, for the last three months, I was down about like four uh, percent. Uh, in starting November, so November, December, and January, I was down, and then uh, I made a rebound uh, in uh, February. So uh, I made uh, I pretty much uh, covered my losses in February. So uh, so the year is still flat for me right now, but uh, still I'm um, I'm looking forward for the year because I still have um, ten more months to go. What, what uh, but last year uh, last year was pretty good. So last year I made on like um, I think almost fifty percent. Oh wow! Return. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what does it mean, uh, trade copy? What did you say, trade copy service? Uh, trade copy or service. So uh, it's a service where um, uh, people uh, who subscribe to my service can um, can copy all my trades. So whatever trades I put on my account will be copied uh, automatically to their account. Oh, that's interesting. So... How does that work? You, you set up with a brokerage so that they will mirror your trades, something like that? Uh, no, we, we have a copy of software that, uh, that we develop. Uh, so, it, uh, so you can use whatever broker you want as long as it's the same platform using um, MetaTrader 4. So uh, whatever broker you use, um, the copier software will copy it uh, to your uh, account. Uh, and then they will prorate the size and everything based, based on your balance. Now, um, Forex works differently for traders than uh, margin on, on stocks, um, as far as I understand it. There's, there's sort of like more, more leverage in, 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 in Forex accounts generally. Uh, the, is, that, mm -hmm. is that the way it works? That's right. Because uh, we, we have like some brokers who offer really big leverage, you know, especially the ones outside the U.S., so yeah, uh, they're pretty much uh, leveled, but I don't really use a lot of the leverage, you know, because I'm uh, managing my risk to a minimum uh, number that I can accept. So I'm only risking about like one percent of my account every time I trade. And is that what you is that what you generally recommend to people when you're teaching them about about trading to 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 not use? Uh, leverage? yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. That's 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 what I would recommend. You know, I'm, I uh, I try to tell them. I mean, even though your broker are, are offering um, like a really big leverage, doesn't mean you have to use it. You know, because um, the more leverage that you use, the more risk that you are exposed to the market. So when you lose, uh, when the trades goes the other way, then you could really blow your account and lose all your money in there. So 
And the less leverage you use is much better uh, when you're, especially if you're just learning to trade. Well, I find that trading options, um, options don't generally, even though options as a, a, in themselves provide leverage in many ways, you're not usually allowed to use leverage as far as options. You have to, if you want to buy an option, you have to have that amount of premium money in your mm -hmm. account. And so that's kept me out of trouble a lot of times, I, I think, uh, as, as opposed to someone using margin to do a leveraged uh, volatility ETF or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I think Forex gets a pretty, uh, it's notorious for, for uh, people coming and going, I think, because of the, the, the leverage that brokerages offer. Do, do you find uh, yeah. Do you find that, that uh, a, a lot of people don't make it? Or is it what? Because what, what, I, I know that like in the overall, uh, one of the things that, that I've had to sort of educate people about as a YouTuber was just the fact that trading is, is really difficult. Uh, it, 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 or at least it, it can be very difficult. It's a, it's a tough game. I think a lot of times people try to get people to uh, go into trading by telling them that it's going to be easy and everybody makes money. And uh, that's not necessarily the case, of course, as you know. No, I mean, I, I tell everybody that I know, you know, when they ask me, like, I mean, you're making money by click. Like say you're clicking like the, a button, right? And you're making money. Well, I mean, it's not that easy. I mean, it, look, it looks easy. I mean, you're just clicking it. But the thing is trading is not easy. I mean, I mean, people don't see like um, how you prepare for the market, like looking at the charts and everything. And then the thing with Forex is like you said, the, the leverage they offer are really big, you know? And then some people um, who doesn't understand how leverage works, they think they can like um, get into the market with like a really big size and then, you know, and they get out with like a really big profit out of it. But at the end, they end up with a with a really big loss instead because they're not managing their risk, um, and that's that's the one of the reason I'm offering a trade service, you know, because um, I mean a lot of uh, uh, I know a lot of uh, people are offering like a say a signal service, so what to buy, you know, what where the stop losses and take profit is, but they usually don't recommend like um, how big the size should be for your trade, and people who doesn't understand uh, that leverage who are just learning to trade. Um, I mean, they take that signal, but they're using a, a wrong a wrong size that a size that's too big for their account, and at the end, um, they blew their account, and then after that, they they kind of like um, uh, traumatic with the experience, and they, that, that's why a lot of people are saying, you know, forex is really dangerous market stuff like that, because the thing is, they they don't understand how to manage them, the risk. So with the trade copy service I'm offering. Um, even the sizes are copied based on their balance, right? So they're, uh, they're going to be mirroring my risk too. And that's how, uh, that's why I'm doing the service. So people won't, I mean, even though I'm, uh, say I'm down like, uh, like the last few months, uh, I'm still managing my risk. I'm only down like say 3% of uh, my account. And then that's why, uh, that way you can rebound more faster than instead of say you're losing like 50% of your account, then you, you're in big trouble already. I mean, it's, it's really hard to, to get back after that, you know? So what are some, um, pieces of advice like let's say I was one of the people that signed up for your copier service uh, what are some uh, pieces of advice that you give them moving forward would somebody typically um, eventually expand beyond your copy service to to make their own uh, their own trades uh, is that the way it would work or would, or uh, would you uh uh, yeah, they, I mean, even when they're copying my uh, my uh, like my trades, right? Uh, they can still make place a, uh, like manually uh, manual trades on their account still. So uh, it's still it's still it's still their accounts uh, anyway. So they can do whatever they want with it. They can put trades, uh, but uh, that's what I would recommend. I mean, if you want to uh, place more trades, you know, just manage your risk um, to minimize, say, like say one to two percent of your account. So even though you're losing. Uh, say you're losing you still have uh, the capital to come back you know and then that's how you rebound well that sounds like great advice i know that people you know people get so excited they like they're like oh, i'm going to be a trader and they get all excited and they want to bet bigger than they should and it's mm -hmm. you know trading a lot of trading is about patience and people it seems people don't want to hear that sometimes you know they want they want some fast money and uh well i mean and and that, a lot of people are marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the killer is the fast money, you know, seems like.
Yeah, because uh, the thing is, a lot of people are saying, you know, trading is like a first, uh, first way to make money and everything, you know. I mean, you, you could trade it and you can get out, like, say, you're making like 10, 20% of the profit. I mean, but if the market goes the other way, I mean, you could lose 10 to 10 to 20 percent of your account too so uh i mean it's the leverage is like kind of a like double-edged sword so it could make you some money but it could lose you money too so I, you you need to manage it carefully yeah I, I i think uh i look at it backwards sometimes and that like if i can manage to figure out how not to lose money then the making money part will come automatically sort of you know what i mean if you can if i can figure out how to manage my risk mm -hmm. so that i so that i'm focused always on where is the spot where i could lose where is the danger zone where is the the most uh money at risk if i can focus on just managing my risks then the the, the money will come in the end and it sounds kind of backwards that way but it, it really is uh well i'm always worried about where my risk is i'm not worried about making money i'm worried about like where am i gonna lose it you know what I mean? Exactly, you know, I, 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 I can't say it any better, you know, I think I agree with what you said, I mean, uh, I mean, the point of trading is just, it's not just making money, it's about how you protect your capital, you know, I mean, without, without your capital, I mean, you're not doing, you're not going to be able to do anything in the market, I mean, I mean, even if you have a, like a great idea or something, when you don't have the money, you don't have anything, uh, you don't, you won't able, you won't be able to execute it, so it doesn't matter if, if, uh, it doesn't matter if you're not managing your risk anymore. And the other thing is just even more than the making of money, it's, it's almost like you want to be right in a way. <laughs> uh, That's it, right. It, it, it's hard. Uh, um, I've, I've had to make an adjustment from being a professional market maker to, to being a retail person. And uh, a lot of the lessons I did learn as a market maker, stuff about being uh, sort of detaching myself from the risk and not getting emotionally too involved and uh, – having a having a disciplined plan ahead of time that i was able to stick to even when things went against me and and this sort of thing but um i've had to relearn again how to manage risk and uh it it can be tough uh th this uh, i'm a little demoralized coming off of today because of the um some stuff has happened in my section of the trading that that has gone against me for this whole month and it's uh it, it, it's hard uh, when you when you're losing for a, a period of time. What, what would be your advice to people when they're when they're when they've taken some losses? Would you say take the positions off and just uh, regroup a little bit, get smaller? What, what, what's the best thing to do when you're losing money? Well, if I'm losing money, you know, I, I like to like just get away for a while, you know, like say for like a like a few days, you know, just to get my head straight. But the thing is, um, I would still recommend, I mean, if, if your system is working for a while, right? I mean, uh, I mean, every great traders have a drawdown. So, I mean, it won't work all the time. But if your system has been working for a while, say, like you've been doing it for a few years and it has, it has been making you money, I mean, just stay with it. I mean, uh, just try to be consistent and still managing your risk. Um, if it's working, then at the end, it's going to work. I mean, you're having a, a little bit drawdown, but it doesn't mean you have to, like, say, uh, uh, up your leverage and something, you know, and take a bigger position just to get uh, your losses back. I mean, just keep trading the way you have been trading and the way that you have been ma uh, been making you money. I mean, just keep doing it that way. But uh, but I would recommend uh, like getting away for a few days just just to get a fresh view on the market, and then and then just keep trading. Then uh, that's what I did after like uh, three months down. Um, I stay away for like a few days and then I look at the charts again and then just keep trading the way I've been. Yeah, some, one thing I found for new people that they don't understand about trading is that you cannot set out to make X amount of money as a trader. You can't say, well, I need to make, I don't know, X amount this month because it's not the way it works. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity comes at different times and you, you, you just have to get in there and... Uh, you know, do do your thing day to day, and uh, and see what happens. In a way, you, you can't you can't like set sort of set financial goals ahead of time for yourself. I found. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, I mean, the market. You know, just you you have to take what the market's giving you. So I mean, you can't really set a number to it. Let's say I want to make like say ten percent a month or something like that. Well, everybody wants to make like that much money, right? Say say ten percent a month, but. The thing is, uh, it depends on the market too. I mean, uh, for us, like a retail trader, 
uh, we can't really move the market with our trades. So we can only go with the flow. So that's that's why we need uh, when the opportunity comes, like you said, uh, just go with it, you know. And then if if it doesn't, then you just wait on the side. What would you say that the average person that would um, open a, a copy account with you? Uh, what, what what would be the average uh, size of account that they they would be uh, coming in with? Uh, would it, would it be uh, very small, or would it be uh, people who have no experience before, or what? What sort of people would be uh, most coming to your service at this point? Uh, actually, uh, my service. Uh it, it it can be used from anybody without any experience to uh, somebody with um, experience who has been a uh, like a, a full time trader but who wants to defi diversify his risk right so instead of diversifying in in uh, in the market i mean say he he doesn't want to trade like a few markets he can just trade in the forex market but but with uh, different traders so uh, so and somebody with no experience at all can also sign up for my service cuz they really don't have to do anything so it'll just um, they'll just copy my trades instead. Uh, so that's pretty much. Uh, so my uh, my service kind of pretty much cover um, everybody from uh, uh, no experience to like a full, full uh, like a pre experienced trader. Um, what um what would be the minimum somebody would would have to have to start like uh, like uh, I don't know like a thousand dollars something like that uh fifty thousand oh. uh, dollars like what what sort of range would it be uh the minimum that uh that i recommend is about twenty thousand so uh that's pretty much so we could cover the the subscription fee and then like still make money a little bit but uh it's it's uh it's a really up to trader i mean uh if he wants to start a, like he or she wants to start with a small trade a uh, small account uh he or she could do that too but uh like I said, uh, twenty thousand dollars is usually the minimum, so it could cover the 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 subscription fee and and still making money. Now, um, what what would you recommend for somebody as far as resources to learn about technical analysis uh, to get some basic uh, read on 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 checking out charts? Uh, are there uh, are you involved with Dale's company at all, or or do you recommend some websites online to? Uh, to, 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 or books to learn about technical analysis to, to just to get a, a basic understanding of things? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not involved in any Dell's company, but um, when, I learn, uh, when I first learned um, technical analysis, uh, I read some of um, Martin Pring's book about technical analysis. Uh, but there are a lot, a lot of um, technical analysis books out there. So, um, yeah, like I said, uh, I mean, uh, what I would recommend is just for like the new traders, like the one just just learn to trade. I mean, they should take a look at some of the, the technical analysis book, uh, like about like trend, the uh, the patterns and everything, how to make a trend line and everything, support resistance. But uh, yeah, it will be good tools for them to, before they get into the market. Uh, are there a lot of people that just start right away with forex? And that's their first introduction to trading, uh, or do people generally start with stocks first, like like you did? Uh, it seems like some people actually really do just start right with forex. Uh, it just depends on who you who you meet first that's in the market and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. Because um, I know a lot of people who who met with uh, like who met with uh, forex traders first before they met with uh, stock traders. So they started in uh, forex uh, market. But uh, the thing is. Uh, the difference is just the leverage, and that's the the reason that uh, people need to be careful if they're going to start with the forex market first. Yeah, um, yeah. It sounds like it sounds like to have your best chance at having. I, I you know, my my goal if I was just starting out in the forex world would be to survive for the first two years. If I can learn how to, uh, you know, break even with my money and stay trading. Mm -hmm. then I would consider that a great success because you're probably beating out over 50% of people if you can learn how to tread water and uh, keep your account going to start with. And that's, yeah. the same, that's the same with Forex or any other kind of trading. Uh, I think people, when they, when they get too much optimism, like they're going to make, you know, a lot of people online will tell you you're going to make 20% per month. And mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're taking the risk to make twenty percent per month, you're you're also taking the risk of not being there in six months. I think. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, I mean, the the realistic uh, expectation is that, like you said, you know, just survive the market for like the first year or two, you know, and after that, 
if you're managing your risk and you're getting used to it, everything, the money will come in by itself at the end. Yeah, I hope I'm not like uh, making it sound too hard for your pitch to get people into your thing. I'm not trying to discourage people from trading. No, no, no. I just like to give people a, a realistic uh, expectation because uh, there's so much stuff online of this crap where it shows somebody with uh, a Porsche and they're like working trading two hours a day and they've got the girls on their arms and they're uh, partying and um, everybody in the group is making 20 percent and that, that's not really the way it works and you know if you want if you want to become a good trader you have to focus focus a lot on it and take it very seriously I would say because w let's face it we're competing with some of the smartest people in the world Definitely. And, and some of the best computer now. Mm -hmm. And they want to take our money if they can do it. Yeah. yeah. So like, like I said before, you know, I mean, um, people don't see like the, the, the hard work that people like the traders put behind, behind that, you know, they only see the trades and everything. But I mean, uh, a lot of traders are spending like a lot of hours in front of the computer, looking at the charts and everything to get, uh, to look at the opportunity market profile. I mean, I spend like 10 to 12 hours a day just looking at the charts. Wow. So, yeah, so um, uh, I know, I, like you said, you know, I know a lot of people are showing like how they, with the Ferraris and everything, you know, they're only trading like say 15 to 20 minutes a day uh, and they're making a lot of money. I mean, that's not a realistic, uh, a realistic expectation if you're trading full time. I mean, the market does work that way, you know, and if, if you're doing that, you're making a lot of money. I mean, uh, it's probably because you're um, uh, over leveraging and risking more than you could afford actually, you know. So w what percentage of your time would you say you spend uh, working on your, your business as compared, uh, I'm talking about your business of subscriber service and that sort of thing, compared with the time you spend looking at charts and trading? Does it, does it take up a, a lot of your time doing that? Uh, not really, because um, like I said, uh, my service is just uh, like a trade copier service. They're, so they're just copying my service. So um, actually it's not... Uh, uh, not interrupting anything with my like uh, my before schedule before the service, you know. So I'm just still doing the same thing, and then I'm placing trades, and then they'll just copy it anyway. So, so I'm not really doing. Hmm? Do you do you fear that um, if you get enough people that are copying your trades, that it's going to move the market? Uh, it's going to start affecting the market. I guess it would have to have be a lot of people for that to happen, right? They're pretty thick markets. Uh, yeah, I think I think Forex has like a five trillion three five trillion dollar transaction every day. So I don't think I'm I'm moving the market anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. This guy I interviewed, he was actually the first guy I interviewed. His name is uh, Justin. He was trading Forex back in the '80s, and where you had to do everything over the phone and was wide markets, and you had to trade huge size. And it's definitely become much more accessible to the general public nowadays. But um, I, I appreciate you uh, explaining a little bit of it to me because, like I said, I, I don't really know much about it at all. It's a different part of the financial world than I'm involved in, but mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely fascinating because, you know, I'm interested in, in what's happening all over the world because my father being uh, in, in uh, business, worldwide business, mm -hmm. inter international uh, uh, trade. And so I was listening to a guy today that was uh, – a forex trader and he he definitely was very focused on world events more than say somebody who was just trading uh apple or something like that i mean obviously mm -hmm. if you're trading apple you might need to worry about world events too to some extent but it's it's a different uh it's a different discipline definitely um so w what's your goal uh for moving forward uh w w where would you like to be uh like five years from now would you like to be retired or do you see yourself trading for uh for for a long time you, you really enjoy um, it? I really enjoy, actually I really enjoy it. You know, I, I don't planning on retiring anytime soon. You know, because um, like I said, uh, well, like I said, I when I first first started doing this, I'm not doing it just for the money. You know, I'm, I really like it when I was when I got introduced to the market. So I'm really enjoying my time looking at the charts and everything, and then you know talking to the other to other traders about about technical analysis and things. So I don't see myself retiring in five years. So um, I think I'm still trading. I'm still going to be trading uh, and then spending my time in front of the charts and everything. And then um, uh, the thing is with Forex too, like I said, the market is open 24 seven. So uh, I can trade anytime, anytime. And then I can spend a lot of time with my family, with my kids, especially I have two little kids, you know, oh, nice. two little children. So yeah, so I, I, I can spend a lot of time with them right now. So that's, that's the real, that's the part I'm really enjoying right now. 
Now, do you have to set limits for yourself so that you're not spending 24 hours a day watching stuff? Because if it is open all the time, it it can be like an obsession, you know, an unhealth maybe an unhealthy mm -hmm. addiction to be like constantly looking at stuff. Do do you f do you have to kind of set limits for yourself? Like, say, I'm going to turn off the screen now for a couple hours, or do you, do you set a schedule for yourself, or does it really depend on what's happening in world events? Uh, yeah, it, uh, it depends on what hap what's happening. Say, so say like in the morning, like in, like right now in Asia, uh, the market sometimes doesn't move, right? Because we only have uh, Japan and like Australia and then like Hong Kong open. So uh, the 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 move was uh, is like um, it's kind of in a range. So it's like a few pips up, up and down. So I don't really uh, uh, I look at the market for a while, and then if there's nothing going on, then I will just turn off the screen and then um, go do something else, you know. But I do set the limits uh, every day for myself because if, if not, you're going to be in front of the screen for like 24 hours because the market always moves, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I can imagine. So yeah, you do have to. Mm -hmm. So you do have to have to set the limits for yourself, and then you uh, you cut off have to find something else to do. You know, well, I, I'm lucky. I have like two 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 children that I have to I have to uh, I, that I can spend time with, so I can get away from the screen. I have I have my reasons to get away from the screen. Yeah, it, you know, it was kind of nice in the old days when it only traded, you know, some some things only traded, like, I think lumber, it only traded like 11 to 2, <laughs> five, uh -huh. days, five days a week. So if you're a lumber trader, you, you know, you trade 11 to 2 and then uh, you can, you know, do something else. You can spend the rest of the day off. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, uh, you know, for, for me in the 90s uh, trading, it was like, you know, uh, like a nine to five job and the weekends are off and uh, you can kind of not think about it as much. But now that it's become, you know, the S&P is always trading and everything's always trading. I, I find I have to kind of set limits for myself a little bit because otherwise you're just constantly looking at this stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. it, being a YouTuber myself, I have to spend so much time with the videos and everything. Have you have you done a lot of um, promotional interviews and things to, to spread the, the, the news about your service? Uh, yeah. uh, no, I haven't really. I think this is only my third interview with. So yeah, I, I've I've been promoting on Twitter, but I I don't really uh, do a lot of promotion on it because um I'm still trading because uh, I'm still trading my own account anyway. So um, but I do promote it uh, once in a while. Do you um, do you use social networking as a trader a lot? Like, are you in chat rooms? Are you do you surround yourself with other traders over over the internet? Uh... Uh, yes, I, I have. Uh, I usually like uh, message uh, some of the traders that I met online. So we we like to discuss the market and everything. So yeah, I find. That I mean, really uh, cool. yeah. yeah, I mean, trading is a lonely profession. I mean, you're sitting by yourself in front of the computer. And, I mean, uh, sometimes you just need like uh, somebody to talk to. You know, like about the market or about something else. But yeah, but I think it's really necessary for. I think that's the only social interaction you can get. I mean, with the other traders, right? Well. Well, it, it can be lonely even when you, even as a pit trader, it can be lonely because when you have a victory, nobody else can really care. You know, it's like, what are you going to yeah. tell somebody next to you? I made X amount of money. Like you seem like you're bragging or something. And when you lose money, mm -hmm. same thing. You can't really share it with somebody. So it's very, uh, it's a strange job because you really are not part of a team. It's very individual. It's very inside your own head. And, uh, it, it it's emotionally uh, can be very taxing at times. So uh, I've definitely found value in being part of some sort of social world with other traders. I think that's been, been very important for me uh, because like you said, you can get isolated and also you, you can get kind of strange in the way you trade things if you don't bounce ideas off other people a little bit, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it's a it's a great way, you know, to look at the market too, like from other from different view and everything. When you share your ideas with the editors, so yeah, it's 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 and I mean, it's not like you're working in an office where you have like a colleagues and everything, right? I mean, here you're just sitting by yourself, so you definitely really need somebody to talk to, or else you know you you're gonna be isolated from the whole world. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, hopefully uh, we can stay in touch, and I can uh, bounce some ideas off of you. Uh, I, I have to figure out. Pleasure. I have to figure out the hours a little bit better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm usually up uh, like early, uh, early in um, in uh, U.S. market. 
I'm still up until like um, uh, midnight. So well, we still have, we have a lot of time to talk about market. If you like? Cool. Well, um, does it? I mean, you don't have to give like the exact dollar figures, but is it expensive your service? As far as uh, how does it work? Do you does somebody pay by the month, or do they pay as a percentage of their account, or how how does it work? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a, like a couple, a uh, few packages that you can choose. It. Uh, can I share my uh, website on over here? Certainly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see the website? I can. Okay. So uh, my website is uh, forexallstars.com. So um, uh, we offer a trade copier service. Um, and the package that we're offering is uh, over here. You can see, uh, you can take a look at it. You can visit our website. It's uh, $200 per month or $500 for three months. And that includes the uh, trade copier service and everything. And then you can, uh, if you would like, you can see all, uh, you can also see my uh, past performance over here. Uh, yes, all my uh, returns in percentage and all the detailed statement too over here, uh, all the trades that I have made. Oh, cool. And so you, you, you said that uh, a person would sign up with their, whichever broker is locally that, that they, uh, that they want to, and then they can copy the trades through the, the network to, uh, from your service to their account. Correct. Yeah. So they could, uh, as long as they offer a MT4 platform, uh, you can use any broker in the in the world, and the software will still work. So you don't have to you don't have to switch uh, to the other brokers and everything. Uh, so you can still use your old account if you have one with the MT4 platform, and then it'll it'll still cop it'll still work on the Ted Copier service. That's cool. Well, I'm definitely going to check out the website and check out the past performance and all that stuff because that's interesting it, it's very uh bold of you to uh to publish all your past performance uh my, my past performance is like very erratic like i've had sometimes when i and a lot of it was to do with uh being a market maker and just the year different years were different things but uh i, I have some years i'm very proud of and some years that I, i'm uh not so proud of <laughs> It's, well, I mean, the only the only reason people would trust me with their fund is uh, if I if I can show them my track record, right? So that's 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 why I publish my uh, detailed statement and everything. So you can take a look at like uh, the, my trades, and then you can take a look at the, how I manage my risk, like how I, I how I put my stop loss and everything. So that's that way you can judge it judge it by yourself and not just trust what I say, you know. That's a, that's that's great. That's awesome. That's interesting. Um, all right. Well, listen. Um, I uh, I've uh, learned some stuff today. Uh, it's easy for me to learn stuff because I start from no knowledge of forex. But uh, I've learned some stuff. Yeah, you did. And uh, um, you seem like a an honest, nice guy that you, you could trust to to, uh, to do business with. So um, it's very nice to meet you. And uh, what what do you see moving forward for? Uh, for the next few weeks, do you think this volatility that's been going on is going to continue with the interest rates moving higher? Um, did you get a chance to check out any of that? Uh, I guess the Powell testimony. I guess uh, everybody's hanging on whether there's going to be two or two to four rate cuts next year in the United States. Uh, do, w what happened today? Do, do you know? I didn't really follow so closely. Yeah, I think uh, he. Uh, I saw some of his testimony. Um, the last, uh, the last two, right? I think one is on Tuesday and the other one uh, yesterday. So I uh, take a look at his testimony. I mean, um, uh, looking at it, I think the volatility for this year is still gonna uh, continue. I mean, we're gonna see a lot of volatility. I mean, especially with um, uh, with the rate hikes coming. I mean, even though uh, people are saying they're factoring, uh, their price in, and everything, I don't think um all of them price in. I mean, if if um. If say the Fed are hiking it uh, more more faster than people expected, you know they're gonna see like a like a lot of volatility in the end. So um, so yeah, I'm still uh, I'm still thinking they're gonna hike, but um, I don't I don't know. Uh, we we need to see like how the market are gonna uh, react. See if they're gonna have they have priced it in. But in my opinion, I don't think they have. Was well, definitely something different than we've seen the last couple of years, at least in the U.S. equities mm -hmm. market. So I think that will create opportunities for us, and stuff's moving around. So um, it's new for some people, but I, I, I think there's going to be opportunity out there. So hopefully we have good uh, some good 
good years. I uh, like I said, the the U.S. There's been some special problems with uh, the volatility ETFs lately, uh, and uh, so it's going to be an interesting year on our end. And it sounds like it's going to be an interesting year on your end too. So uh, I, I wish you the best of luck moving forward. And I, I really appreciate you uh, agreeing to do an interview with me without knowing who I am or anything like that. That's very kind of you to spend some time with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, I like to, I really like uh, meeting new people and talking about the markets and everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad if I can teach you anything, you know, I'm, I'm still learning too. So uh, hopefully I do. T I, I mean, I have imparted some knowledge on you, you know, even though I'm not really good at explaining things, but hopefully you learn something from me. And then um, I definitely like, uh, really like to get in, I mean, keep in touch with you. That sounds great. All right. Well, good luck with the rest of today and um, and stay in touch. Definitely. OK, definitely. I will. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Do you want to help us? We are teaching people to be financially independent. Being part of the solution, will you donate five dollars to support this YouTube channel, which is just starting out? You will feel good every time you watch.